No one is presenting. Yeah, no, not 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 a wonder. So, um, great pleasure seeing seeing all of you. Uh, looking forward to see some of you in person very soon, and uh, I may need to to leave by a phone call for another meeting. But let's uh, st try to start together. Um, maybe London will be first. Aaron will be next. Any anyone else wants to present today? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so London, could you could you please uh, uh, make sure that you project not only as a screen, but uh, well, let's. It 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 will be an effort to make it to present. Hi, Fatima, how are you? Doing good, thank you. You probably want to change uh, which camera you're using. What's that? There is a remote control. Well, I got the like polycom, whatever thing. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, wait, hold on. We are seeing, we are seeing, we are seeing the class. There is no. We can't hear you. You cannot. Are you guys muted right now? No. Can you hear me now? Can you hear us now? It's on your end. Can you hear us now? Please confirm. Okay, so we're the 
Good text. <laughs> Can you see this? We're talking on that stuff on the online. Online, there there is uh, sound from uh, them, but not from us. Oh. Do you hear us now? No. So, Do you hear yeah. us now? So we're just going with it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> no, no. Just a second. We'll start this group meeting sometime. We will. Um. Is this issue in our speaker or the We, we were hearing you all the time. Okay. So we can hear you right there. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, we do not see the okay. content. Choose the polycon main options here. Okay. So now you make some noise. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a little bit more up. Sure. Right there. Yeah. Okay. So let, please, please start. Okay. So yeah, I'm uh, doing interfacial electron dynamics. Uh, so some of the literature that I've been reading, um, one of the things that they did is a lasso regression to figure out some of the more important parameters for uh, an analysis. I guess I'll talk more about that later. But this is a basic version of that lasso regression. I don't know if you guys have all seen this before or not, but I've never seen it, so I was really confused. Um, so this is probably the most basic version of it, and this isn't exactly what they did in the paper, but it, it at least gets the point across. Um, so you have like something that you measured, like say your electron orbital or something like that, or your, uh, in this case, the transition rate, um, and you have some parameters that you're looking at that have some effect on that. Uh, so you define essentially a sum with some arbitrary coefficients, and uh, you'll be modifying these later. So what you try to do is minimize the absolute value of the difference between the actual thing that you observed and your created version of that, essentially, that you created through your sum. Um, then you have a, I uh, can't remember what the actual name of it is right now, but you have a variable lambda that you can increase. And as you increase that, the I, I don't know the exact details of how this ends up working, but uh, the idea is that as you increase lambda, the less important parameters will have the coefficients tend to zero quicker than the parameters that have a larger effect on your own. Um, whatever it is that you're measuring, I guess your output. So I guess just to kind of show you how they're doing that. Uh, so these top two plots here are the lasso regression, and then these bottom two are just regular linear regression. So in this paper, what they're looking at, at least one of the things that they're looking at is the difference between a monodentate and a bidentate configuration between uh, titanium dioxide and the dye. Um, so on the left side, they're looking at the initial five femtoseconds of the transition rate, and then on the right side, they're looking at, uh, I believe it was two picoseconds, so a much longer time scale. So in the, in the initial uh, transition rate, the, the last regression essentially tells them that the, the most important parameters are the, the density of your electronic state on the, uh, on the actual linkers, that's what this uh, percent mean link or row linker is. The uh, log row accepts that is representing the, the density of acceptor states for the transition. And the, uh, the delta E, that's just the difference of energy between the, the excited state on the die that they're starting from and the, the state that they're transitioning to on the, um, in the conduction band of the titanium dioxide. So they do this regression, they figure out that Okay, the most important parameters for this particular thing are uh, the percentage of the density actually localized on the linker, the, um, the density of the acceptor states, and the energy difference between the, the excited state that it starts in and the, um, the acceptor states that it ends in, I guess. So when they do a normal linear regression using those three variables, they actually end up getting pretty good correlation between the transition rate and some combination of those parameters. I'm not sure exactly how they actually did that combination. Um, but then when they do the same thing for a longer time scale, they not get anywhere near that good of a correlation with even more parameters. So essentially what this shows is that Fermi's golden rule is valid for very short time scales. But as you go to longer and longer time scales, it begins to fall apart and becomes less and less accurate. Um, no. Keep going. Please so, keep going. Okay. Yeah, I'll just keep going. So uh, I guess that's some of the stuff that I've been reading about. Um, so previously, what I've done as far as one-dimensional wave packet dynamics was uh, I had uh, titanium uh, not uh, perovskite and a spiral with that die and use the the log plot.c files which were integrated over like the x and the y dimensions that gives you a one dimensional potential um, and then I just ran one dimensional wave packet dynamics with that potential so uh, these were the transition rates that were um, that I calculated from those I guess and uh, let's see. So what I'm working on right now 
London? Uh, London? Uh, one back. One side back. Um, suppose that audience is consists of not professionals. How do we know what what it will? Right now there is no chance, but in the in the future add some equations. There are there is yeah. there is a group of people who um, blind towards figures and understand only equations. Okay. Okay. Keep going. So okay. So right now what I'm trying to do is instead of integrating over two of the dimensions and using that to yield the one dimensional potential. Um, I'm trying to find other ways to reduce the problem down to one dimension in order to increase computational efficiency. Um, the goal, I guess, is to not throw quantitative accuracy completely out the window. Um, so what I've got plotted here are some MATLAB contour plots of the, uh, of essentially just like a slice of the three-dimensional potential. Um, so this simulation is represented in fast by 112 by 112 by 180 um, array of cubes, I guess. So this is just shy of the halfway point. This one is right at the halfway point, and this one is just past the halfway point. Um, you can kind of see the, the different structures here. The white is at about like 2 EV, and all the, the darker purple gets down to around like negative 60 EV. Um, so I guess one of the I was playing around with one of these one-dimensional plots that I took. I guess this one in particular is uh, straight through the middle of this plot here. If you just go vertically up that, then you get this potential. And the numbers did not come through. Um, so doing it this way, I guess you have significantly deeper potential wells. This one goes down to about negative five EV, if I remember correctly, and you get hardly any transition at uh, the high end of momentum that I was looking at before. Um, so this one. Uh, London, can, yeah. can, can I ask? So uh, I'm on the next slide uh, right now. This yes, one? yes. Um, it's not clear. Maybe, maybe I, I just was not focused. How the initial conditions were chosen? What is the red line at time zero? Oh. Uh, so that is chosen to be one of the eigenstates of that potential. So this is one of the, this is probably like the 12th or 13th eigenstate or something like that. I was just playing around with it and I had this one on hand, so I used this one for, uh, for my PowerPoint, I guess. So what was the um, cr criterion to select this state? Um, you probably you were looking for something localized on the perovskite, but what were other criteria to select initial uh, wave function? Uh, I guess is there something in particular that you're trying to get at, or um, is it, this wasn't really particularly chosen. I guess I was just kind of playing around with it, and this was the file that it had most recently written. So I just kind of played with it because it at least works. Okay, so uh, let, let, let me comment. Can I? Yeah. So uh, we are looking on a charge transfer of electrons. And uh, if you repeat this presentation in the future, you may introduce it. So it's not holes, it is electrons for the, for the titanium right. dioxide. Which means you need not any orbital localized on a perovskite, but orbital that belongs to conduction band, that is uh, higher than a forbidden band, that belongs to conduction band. Right. And if you are yeah, not this is taken from the total potential. But from um, it is a big problem how to connect eigenstates of the total potential and actual states uh, in the in the quantum system. It is much more reliable to right. take actual uh, eigenstates of uh, actual states that come out from DFT, project them in the same way as you do, do here, and use as the right. initial yeah. state. So why I'm asking this question? Right now, probably you offset your red line uh, on the y-axis according to the energy, and it looks yes. it looks so deep uh, below the barrier, so it is clear that it will not. Uh, 
uh, overcome the barrier. And probably because this state would correspond to a uh, localized hole deep inside the valence band. If you, if you are approaching right. near the um, forbidden band, it will be much closer to the, um, to the, to the barrier. O overall, it will be higher. Uh, I have another. Yeah, so that's, I guess. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what is transfer probability? How do you define it? Because I don't see that anywhere. Oh, yeah, I guess I didn't actually define that. Um, so, I guess in this sense it's discrete, so you just sum the. Where are we here? Okay, so in this one dimensional potential here, can you see my house, I guess? No, but I. I think I already know how you do it. I just wanted to bring it to your attention that it's nowhere. And someone that would ne right. like never looked at this would be completely lost. R right now it is presentation oh, yeah, for closed yeah, community of those who right. were yeah, running. Yeah, I'm definitely not writing this as far as like a, an actual presentation. This is more of like an update of where I'm at. Okay. Oh, um, okay. That's, that's good to keep in mind. <laughs> so, yeah, you essentially just sum from that kind of in the middle over to the far right side, um, you just take that total and that should be your transition probability. Okay, that makes sense. Technically divided by, yeah, divided by the total probability, which comes out to be one in this case anyway, so. Uh, okay, so this one now, this potential was taken from, let's see, uh, right along here. Mm -hmm. So you've got like your 40 wells in the perovskite, and then you've got your other two smaller wells in the titanium dioxide. Um, but this one goes down to around negative 60 eV, so there's, I mean, definitely no chance of any electron getting out of there. It just kind of shakes around. Um, so that's what I have going right now. And then in addition to that, I'm currently running MD jobs on uh, the hydroxyl model that I showed earlier, I guess, where I pull all the one-dimensional stuff from. I'm also doing it with an acetic acid linker on the left here, and then uh, kind of a flipped titanium dioxide. Um, so this one in the middle I'm doing in the neutral states, the plus one, plus two, and plus three oxidation states. And then on the far right, it's, uh, it's the same flipped titanium dioxide, but instead of the, the old perovskite, I guess there's addition additional cesium and uh, bromine thrown into there. Um, so what I'm going to be working on in the near future will be uh, developing an algorithm that will take your three-dimensional potential and essentially trace out like a path of least resistance through it. And then from there, you can use that the arc length of that path as, a, as the single dimension for the one-dimensional wave packet dynamics. So then once I can do that, then I could figure out a way to essentially do this whole thing again, except with the par charge files, so that I could actually represent the individual orbitals that I'm looking at instead of the total potential, because that's not really going to work. Um, and once the MD job's finished, I'm going to be analyzing those and actually getting the much more quantitatively accurate uh, I guess numbers for all of this. And when I do that, I can then compare the the MD results with the one dimensional results and see if it's you know close or what can be tweaked to improve it or you know whatever. So that's where I'm at. Okay, let's upload. <laughs> Any questions to oh, please keep the slides. Maybe someone wants to challenge you about any of the results. <laughs> Are there any questions in Fargo? Are there any questions in Los Alamos? Y yes, there are. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, London, what, what are you going to do after you complete uh, molecular dynamics? What is well, it? Actually, yeah? I, I've never actually done like, the, the actual rigorous analysis through FASP, so I'm going to basically be learning that as I go. Um, I, I don't really know for sure what exactly it is that I'm going to be doing. Okay, so um, their molecular dynamics is only introductory step to a big uh, story. And uh, yeah. right now, 
uh, Aaron will be presenting his poster and uh, your uh, task, your goal is to uh, learn basic idea where we go after molecular dynamics, wh what it brings us to. And then please try to interview Dr. Han, Aaron, me, Javed about how to get couplings if you if you already got molecular dynamics. This is uh, what are couplings, how to compute them. It, it is a big challenge, uh, not only in uh, intellectual understanding, but in computational resources. It is uh, the most expensive uh, job compared to anything we do. Calculating the orbital series. No, no, it is okay. it is ten thousand times more com, com, uh, com, uh, expensive computationally. Okay. So it is it, it is. Uh, um, please stay intrigued and try to resolve this intrigue yourself. It will be more interesting compared to if someone will uh, instruct you step by step. Okay, let's thank uh, London once again. And uh, let's give stage to Aaron. What is on, on the screen? Email. Email? It looks this way? Yeah. They change. Oh, you never sign into your, India's email? <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> no, I, I do have the ma mailer program. Oh, OK. You're great, can you be me? Wow. It is what I have written here, you know, security breaches. I'm just saying you're a brave human being. Everyone see it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you can focus on uh, uh, the screen and make it a little bigger. I don't. Um, I mean, uh, focus the camera with the remote control. Oh. Zoom. Zoom in. Right now it shows, uh, um, Aaron, right now the camera, uh, yeah, and, and put it uh, up, higher up, it shows too much margins. Instead of screen, it shows more up, more up. Yes, perfect. So, so this is an 
updated version of my poster from Sanibel. And since we're going to the conference on excited state properties, I probably uh, dump half of what was on here before and replace it with relevant excited state property stuff. That's what I did. So I'll walk you through my poster. So the way I'm framing it is we are modeling excited state dynamics in a closed shell quantum dot perovskite and an open shell perovskite. And the open shell is doped with the manganese plus I'll make it an open cell, open shell system while traditional like stoichiometric perovskites are closed shell. So we're just gonna see if we our methodology can model both of them accurately because uh, in both of these systems for perovskite spin over coupling is important because in the perovskite quantum dot the conduction band is composed of lead six P orbitals which have experienced strong spin orbit interactions and even the bromine that it's used has a little bit of spin orbit interactions as well that affect them and then for the dope system to model uh, emission in those it's uh they're a high spin uh, complex so for emission to occur it's going to be a spin flip and that's mediated through spin orbit coupling as well so it's needed to describe excited state properties for both systems and Traditionally, spin orbit coupling isn't incorporated into many software or any commercial software. Like Galaxy N, you can't compute uh, spin flip spectra easily yet. And yeah, it's not in BASC because BASC is a ground state, so you can't technically compute excited state properties in BASC as well. But we use uh, BASC outputs to parameterize equations to model excited state properties. So, yeah, that's kind of the outline of what we're going to do for our poster. And you see up in the very left corner is the intrinsic perovskite quantum dot that we're going to model. And it's fully passivated by ligands. That's what the hazy kind of transparent outside is. And then the blank inside is a 2 by 2 by 2 uh, shell of uh, metallic perovskite. And, and down here is our the quantum dot that is doped and is doped specifically in the center, replacing the lead and it's placed in a bromine uh, alloy field or ligand field, which uh, will influence its electronic properties, which we'll get to later. And here's all good methodology stuff. So I basically just described the ground state electronic structure electronic kind of structure how BASC computes uh, spinner orbitals that we'll use for our excited state calculations. And then our ground state, the traditional ground state observables are density of states and optical spectra for uh, Aaron? spinner orbitals. And the Aaron, yep. uh, can you comment on difference of your equation for transition dipole in spinner basis compared to closed shell? Transition dipole. What, how this equation would uh, please point the equation for transition dipole and uh, tell how it would look like in the simplified way if there is no uh, if there is no uh, spinner, no spin polarization. What will be different? Okay, so, what would be different is if you look on the left. So, what we normally call a cone champ orbital is composed of spin alpha and spin beta orbitals, or traditionally it's spin alpha or spin beta. They're separate from each other. There's no mixing between them, but with spin orbit coupling, you get the superposition. And then when you stick that into the transition dipole equation, you get the, you essentially get a sum of two spin states that can compute, that can contribute to your uh, transition dipole, or contribute to your spectrum. So it's not just an alpha transition, or just the beta optical transition that's a little bit of both. So that's what makes uh, spinner orbitals unique compared to either spin restricted or spin polarized. Because if it was spin polarized, it would just be an alpha, right, it would just be one wave function here, not a vector of alpha and beta. Okay. Is that clear enough? Yep. And then yeah, it's the same deal we compute couplings, which is a 
one word that Dimitri was looking for earlier when he was talking about what's after MP. So, so for a coupling, we get the, so it's not, it doesn't just couple alpha to alpha or beta to beta orbitals, it'll couple alpha and beta orbitals that compose the same spinner. So we get additional kind of additional pathways there, which will see show up eventually in our regular tensor. Uh, Aaron, Aaron uh, can, can I interrupt? Yep. So uh, can you make a little more introductory overview of what is non-adiabatic coupling and why does it need molecular dynamics? And specifically, what is R capital in your equations? Specifically for London. Yes. So, so non adiabatic couplings are, so traditionally, like when you learn this stuff, you assume more and Oppenheimer approximations, which essentially means that if you, if your ion changes, the, it doesn't produce changes in your orbital occupations, it's just the energy of the orbital changes corresponding to your change in ionic position. So it's kind of like the potential problem. Like your energy is kind of sloshed back and forth, but it won't it'll cause an excitation. Like it won't cause an excitation across the bank now or to other states. We'll just call it like state switching and some other stuff. But with not adiabatic couplings, you can, it goes beyond Bohr and Oppenheimer approximation. So it's basically like these are two ions and they oscillate back and forth. You get different mixing of your. Uh, of orbitals at each time step, and those are your non adiabatic couplings. It's uh, changes in population due to thermal fluctuation. So, you're, uh, so if you have a hot electron, it cools down through non adiabatic transitions, like a solar cell. That's how it relaxes to the band edges. So, that's why we do MD, so we can get those ionic motions to get the couplings. And then, Aaron? Can I, can I uh, yes. intervene? So um, if you do calculation of molecular dynamics at zero Kelvin, what the non-adiabatic couplings will be equal to? Um, well, you assume classical particles would be zero. What if? Because there's no. Y yes, it is zero if i and j if initial and final orbitals do not coincide what if they do coincide should it shouldn't be one i guess so um like well, it will be it will be one multiplied by uh, constants in front of uh, of the equation. So uh, um, I'm making a comment specifically for for London. If you look on equation uh, that uh, Aaron is presenting, the first line after the word non-radiative relaxation. So it has the overlap of orbitals with. Uh, index i and orbital with index j so it is kind of um, orthogonal relation if uh, there is no dependence on r capital on position of ions so at zero kelvin due to or, or due to orthogonality due to orthogonality this um, uh, should bring a delta function. London, would you buy this argument? Can you repeat it one more time? Pardon? He's asking you to rephrase the question. I, think. I, I was also paying attention like what Aaron was trying to do too, so I, I missed like part of that. So I, I can't say yes or no right now. Um, London, do you see connection between equation for V sub IJ and orthogonality relation for wave functions? I 
can't read the equation from where I'm at. Uh, ask Aaron to, to make it readable for you. Go to your right, it says create PDF. Ah, uh -huh, perfect. Oh, wow, that's, that's nice. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, wow, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Let's see. Oh, wow, that's nice. Let's see. Oh, 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 that's nice. Let's so, and this should be a K, or these should be Ks instead of I's. Okay. You got a K. So, you take Psi I, or Psi star I, Psi J, what is that normally? Zero if they're orthogonal. Yeah. Or one if I equals J. Yeah. Right, yeah. But if we explore this relation under conditions that R capital, which is position of I and are uh, moving vividly, then this orthogonality will be violated. It will be not 1 if i equals j, and it will be not 0 if i not equal j. But we need, yeah. we need to explore it. If you take only one point along the trajectory, or two points along the trajectory, it will, be not, um, uh, it will not help us. It will be very random. But if you explore a long trajectory and make an average, it will give us uh, average uh, measure of non-orthogonality of electronic orbitals due to nuclear motion. Yeah, that makes sense. Aaron? Yep. Uh, in your second line, uh, where you mentioned to replace I to... No, 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 no. Second part of the first equation. You mentioned, yes, to replace uh, I with J. And also, one may want to, uh, to have argument of R capital, T plus delta T. So it's, uh, the okay. orbital should be offset. It will be uh, neighbors uh, uh, along the trajectory. Or alternative, inter alternatively, one can put... Uh, the partial derivative over time between these two uh, orbitals. But it's simpler to just put t plus delta t for the, uh, those that are not conjugated. So uh, this, at, at this equation, London may stop uh, thinking, because uh, to implement this equation in computation is very hard problem. So R capital sub i is a trajectory that may contain like up to 1,000 or above uh, steps. And then one needs orbitals at each step of the trajectory and uh, compute their overlaps. So uh, London, please try to interview anyone you can catch for numerical protocol to implement this equation. Okay. Good. Aaron, thank you for your patience. Please continue. So then, we do 
a bunch of Fourier transforms and autocorrelations and all that good stuff. And then you use that to parameterize these equations, which describe a, like energy transfer from electronic degrees of freedom to nuclear degrees of freedom. So like this first term is just like your regular, It's called unitary time evolution, so energy conserving. And then this uh, addition part is the dissipation, where that describes electron photon interaction. And that's where all the good stuff happens. And that's, we basically compute a bunch of red field tensor elements, which is this big RIJ LM. And then we use some approximations just to make them IIJJs, or it makes calculations simpler, or easier, plus. Intensive to so like IJ, L, and M are all the same type of thing? Are there orbital indices? Okay, yeah, so they're not like, you're not talking about like, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So we do it with I. Well, I mean, L and M are not the usual, like, quantum numbers. L and right. M. Okay. Yeah. So that's what happened. I actually don't have any radiative stuff on this poster, so I'll skip that. Okay. Um, yeah, so the actual results. So, I guess first we'll start with the closed shell system for our, for our observables. So, this is just the intrinsic quantum dot computed with spin restricted cone sham, or like a regular calculation we use to like run math. And then spinner orbitals, which is an NCL, or non collinear calculation. And the main difference that we see is pairing the two is a reduction in the band gap due to spinner coupling of the lead 6p atoms. And it produces a, or decreases the band gap by about 0 0.74 EV, which is a pretty significant re reduction. And then below that is just the partial density of states composed between proskite atoms and ligand atoms. You can see the green curve is the one that jumps down to the perovskite that's reducing the band gap. And then another thing to note is there's these red lines are for ligand density states, and none of them go into the gap. So that indicates that the quantum dot is well passivated and there's no trapped things in the system. So then this is plot of the spectra for both systems for uh, spin restriction and spinner with the same color scheme. And you see a reduction of the onset of transition energy. So that's just due to the reduction of the band gap. And we saw the density of space. And another curious thing is you see that the with the spinner computed spectra, the like the lowest transition will be your PL transition actually increases by about four times, which is interesting. I'm not sure, hopefully this can be, I'm not sure if that's an artifact of our code or if it's real, or an artifact of mass code. Because I haven't seen anything before done before, but it's just an interesting note. And then, yeah, on the right is the table of uh, transitions that correspond to the labels in the spectra. And so, we do have the compute uh, couplings between all of them. Then we generate red field tensors for both spin restricted and spinner basis, which are these two images. So the one on the left, this is kind of typical for a red field tensor. If you have uh, I have a question before you go to the different story. And I, yeah. I have a feeling that I probably already asked this question when you were showing pretty much the same data for Sunnyfield Symposium, right? Mm -hmm. So like your peak, which you said like appearing when you have a spin orbit calculations, right? Your spinner calculations. This peak appearing at less than 2.5 electron volts, right? Yes. And then if you look on your density of states, the green one is also for the spinner, right? Say that again? The figure on the top 
uh, above above your absorption spectra, the density of states. The green line here corresponds to the spinner calculations. Yes. So then I don't understand how your low state is having much less energy comparing to the energy between the low coma and dimma. Because here the gap is something around three, definitely not two point five between the green lines, right? Or maybe I don't know what is A and B difference here. It's hard to say. Oh, B is a spinner. A, A is spin restricted. Or the left panel is spin restricted. The right panel is spinner. Oh, okay. So you're on. The, so, so just green line. Green line is uh, it's your distribution. I mean, um, it's it's projection to some uh, to some species. Um, okay. So B is I mean, the gap. Green is projection to ligands. I see. I see. It's, so green here is not the same as green on the other figure. Uh, and then the gap is around two uh, something. Okay, uh, otherwise, so then it makes sense. Green, okay. green is uh, core semiconductors and red is ligands. Right, but I thought that it's also showing kind of a dose of spinners versus dose of unrestricted states. Uh, restricted states and okay, it makes sense. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, so red field tensors. So, was saying this is kind of typical of red field tensor. Looks at the trend anyway. It's when you're deep in the valence band, you have higher values of transitions. And then when you get closer to your uh, band edge, it's your transition rates kind of slow down because you have less density of states near the edges. So you, those contribute less to your transition probability. So further away from the band edge, higher up your elements are, the closer you get, the lower they get. And but we see a different trend with our spinner computed red field tensor, you can see there's like an alternating peak. And it goes high, and then it kind of goes low, and then high, and low again, high, and low again. And then another feature is there's more off diagonal elements. You can I zoom in, but it'll be easier to see. A little blurry, but you can see there's a lot more on the off diagonals compared to your spin restricted. And that would be expected for spinner orbitals because what they do is they mix spin states, so you're mixing more orbitals, so we should get more off-diagonal elements. So that's a good trend. But the alternating pattern kind of confused me for a while, but then as one day when I was looking at the electronic structure for these systems, which I put in a table on the side, so this table here is uh, homolumo plus minus five from the, from the band gap, and then this first element is the energies. And you can see that each energy is twice degenerate for some reason. So it seems, I, don't know, I, can't, I can't think of a good way to explain why that is, but that would explain why there's an alternating pattern between high and low, because if you degenerate an energy, it's like, no energy barrier to transition from one, one orbital to the other. So, like, you would have very fast transition rates between homo minus 5 and homo minus 1, but then from homo minus 1 to homo minus 2, it's going to decrease. So, you're telling of the trend that uh, MZ uh, Z projection, like uh, 41 minus 41, 0, 05 uh, minus 0, 0.05. Is it the numbers you are telling about? Yes. So we, we need to, to look for the value of the MZ uh, column in, in this table. Mm -hmm. And observe alternation of sign because it is either um, mostly alpha or mostly beta. Yes. Okay. Or, or it could be equal alpha beta, but they're just um, like orthogonal. Okay. So equal composition orbitals. Mm -hmm. So that kind of explains like the weird trend that we see in the red field tensor. Or well, we see the alternating pattern. And then what's the impact on relaxation rates? You might be asking yourself at this point. So for the spin restricted. So 
just looking at the green figures that we usually generate, you can see that both the electron and mole, they both relax on roughly the same time scale as between some picosecond to picosecond. They're both in between negative one and zero on this chart, so it's roughly at the same time scale. Uh, the spitter orbitals actually are a little bit quicker relaxation to the band edges. And if I migrate to my tables again, so table one explicitly shows the rates for all these. They, they show that uh, the spinner relaxation rates for electron and hole are a little bit quicker than uh, spin restricted. I guess this can be attributed to since there's more spin mixing, there's both additional relaxation pathways to, for excited space to relax. So that just kind of helps facilitate the process. Because it's kind of like parallelization that's what you do, right? It speeds up whatever you're trying to accomplish. So that's the way I rationalize it anyway. And yeah, so the takeaway from all that is spin orbit coupling helps enhance non radiative relaxation for the frisky and close shell cross-cutting mock nut. So, so I will move on. So. Uh, what exactly, like in your in your right column, right? So you're showing non-radiative relaxation constants. K E yes. K H, right? So this is a constant yes. which corresponds to your figure seven, right? Yes. Which you just described. Yep. So then my question is, what? How you were like? What is what is this? Uh, how you how you actually get this rates? Is it rates? Yes, it's rates. Uh, um, because usually you can get it through the kind of you know fitting with exponential function right and then you have just e to the power of tau right and this is your rate but your your plots especially with the spinner they're definitely not exponential at all um, so it's plotted on a log scale for time then it should be a straight line yes isn't it? In a log, it should be just a line if it's exponential. I do have breaks. You have more complicated uh, structure. Maybe it's uh, uh, bi-exponential. I don't know. Maybe it's polynomial. Maybe it's something. But definitely, it's, it's not exponential behavior. Did you ever look at like a kinetic view where you have different states, like initial state, final state, intermediate? But, but before we go there, could you just explain how you get this 3.34, 2.27? How this data where? Where did you extract it? How did you get this uh, rates? So we do assume single exponential rate, and we. So you were fitting this, like let's say, on your figure seven, you have a dashed black line. So you kind of fit this black line with an exponent, and it was fitting nicely. You, then you have to show the fit. I can picture the equations in my head, I just can't describe them right now. So, assume, we assume an exponential fit. We do some sort of integration and then pull it out of there. I can't. I but, but I don't understand why you need to assume exponential fit if you just can't have an exponential fit. If it's exponential relaxation, then you just take your exponent, right, fit it accordingly, just showing it on your figure seven, and it's either aligns with your dynamics or not. So the question is, uh, how large is the error accumulated if the dynamics deviates from exponential relaxation? Uh, how the figure would look like if one plug in computed relaxation rate and put literal exponential. exponential relaxation onto the same figure. Would it match this dashed and solid line or would it deviate to some extent? I guess I'm not sure. No. Well, it is not for immediate answer, but uh, it is um, like... 
Well, and if you were using some special formulas, and this formula, and you you cannot repeat, you kind of you cannot just immediately write this formula or pronounce this formula right away, then it has to be in your poster as well to get in these numbers, right? Because it's a very simple question: How did you get it? And you you cannot really answer. <laughs> Maybe put uh, in under radiative relaxation, there there are a couple of square inch space. Or when probably can paste this uh, equation, and if the poster is already printed, one can print it on regular paper and just. Uh, or just write by hand. Glue stick or. Tap or, it. Yeah. Instead of having a bigger poster, you get this much. Yeah, and, and now Levi has some ideas, probably. So if it turns out that it's not a single exponential, did you ever think about any like kinetic model, where you have like the initial state, you have some rate to an intermediate, and then some rate to the final? And I think Dimitri said this, but I don't know if he thinks it's a good idea. Um. Aaron, can I start answering on this question for you? Please. Because uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me start let, answering. Just look at um, the new line, right? So it looks like you have like two steps here. So like exponent one. So exponent let, one. let me, um, I am answering on behalf of Aaron. Please be patient and wait until the speaker goes on to, over the third column to the, to the bottom of the third column where this, um, Issues have been addressed computationally. Aaron, am I right? Uh, the, bo the bottom of your third column with manganese doped open shell. Yes, it shows kinetics that Levi is requesting. This is not kinetic. Well, you will have discussion. Okay. And uh, the blue. Um, green figures with blue and orange lines do have multi-step uh, relaxation that you have computed. Well, he is definitely more steps comparing to the pristine, uh, but even in pristine, especially for the electrons, uh, for the holes, for the blue lines, it's holes, right? It looks like you really have like several steps there, like it's several levels, computation, mainly computation. So from oh. From the plot, will you have population versus time step that goes from zero to 10,000? Why couldn't you fit a kinetic model to either that data or a simple, simple down version? And then you could get your rates as a function of population and time. I think that's what the Redfield equation already does. Does the Redfield equation give you uh, rates? Okay. That's what the Redfield tensor is. It's the rate to transition between the state I and J. So each, the magnitude of each of these bars is a rate. So then you can just sum from your initial state to your homo? No, no, no. This is not, it, it goes I to J, but this is just for the for the nearest, uh, oh, what is it? What is your I and J? This is just two level systems then. No, it, 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 it just has it along the uh, off diagonal, along the nearby off diagonal. That's where the greatest elements are, but you can have off diagonal. So, so it's not the overall rate. No. It's just the rate, it's not rate, how it goes. Individual, it's, it's elemental, individual elemental, jump. Elemental, it's elemental. the time of the jump between each nearest yeah. or whatever, each, each state I and state J, right? Yes. But again, to, when we talk about trade, it has to be kind of an averaged cumulative that combines cumulative all this uh, elementary from initial to the final, not in between each of them, right? And this gives you much more complicated behavior rather than exponential in, in, in many systems. In some systems, it can be just exponential. I'll send you a paper with this in it if I can find it again. CC to everyone. Reply to invitation to the meeting so that everyone can participate in this discussion. The paper of the day.
so yeah, that's kind of what these population images are. It's the changes in population over time. Like once it gets occupied, it's, it's still like kicking off population. Like it's always counting something coming in, and something in population going out. But your pop uh, maybe I'm too early. But the population plots, which is your figure eleven, right? And I guess we even yeah. didn't go to figure eight. But this population figure eleven is showing for the manganese doped uh, manganese doped uh, structures, right? Yeah, the whole the whole states. Okay. So, but you can make the same plot for your case of the closed shell perovskite quantum dot, pristine quantum dot. I can. I'll get to the way, get to the, get to the top, work my way down. So, this is the open shell system. But, 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 but still, could you conclude, just because it's kind of, it, it looks like you finished your story about closed shell perovskite quantum dot. So, could you just conclude this column, uh, and then you go to your story of the doped case? Like what exactly your main observables? What is the most important thing which you found out from this? Or you think is the most most important one? Or maybe two of the most so, important ones? So I think, I think the biggest thing I took away from this study is that comparing the spinner relaxation, non radiative relaxation to the spin restricted, there are more pathways for non radiation relaxation in the spinner case. And I think that contributes to the rates being slightly quicker compared to the spin restricted. Because you have just more relaxation relaxation pathways and that can contribute in, to the enhanced yeah. relaxation. I guess I don't but when you compare when you compare these two calculations, your it, it looks like it's your main results A and B for the figure seven. Um, uh, then kind of uh, I'm a little bit confused why you have uh, why your relaxation is at different energies. You excited much higher energy for the case of restricted case, right? And significantly low energy excitation goes to the spinner. So it can be the thing which you say really contributing to the due to the spin orbit couplings which might contribute or it just means that you initially excite a different state which has different couplings with vibrations and that's why your relaxation is different like if you want really compare two cases looks reasonable to compare them exactly at the same initial conditions you have to excite exactly in the same energy range so what, what was the criterion to select initial conditions was it um value of uh, oscillator strengths, the transition that gives uh, biggest contribution, was it resonance to specific uh, incident photon wavelengths, or it was just uh, same indices as the wild shot? And again, you... If I look on your figure five, so, sorry to interrupt you, but figure five is just related, right? So where exactly you excite in your absorption spectra? For, for, for the case A and B for six seven. If I just look on a so, figure five for for kind of seeing where your excitation is. It should both be around the B category. Oh, okay. So so you excite to B feature of the spectrum, but uh, you, you want to have qualitatively. No, this is not right. No. No, because look look on a seven y-axis so you go roughly from two from minus two to two so it's about four electron volts if you look on the b case you go from minus 1.5 to the two so it's 3.5 so it's a smaller range exactly it is what what is shown here but b, b is kind of no, the same no b prime oh, is b prime b prime, b prime is uh, without uh, spin orbit and b is uh, oh he's okay i thought he's talking about c and no b. it is okay, not absolute c, it is not absolute value but it is qualitative b, b and b prime okay. same feature on the qualitative spectrum mm -hmm. but it, it needs to be introduced because even mm -hmm. people in the, in the area will not uh, read the mind mm -hmm. or maybe you can I mean, it's too late right now to do any changes, of course, but just for future kind of uh, check, 
uh, what if you excite to your the green line it would be excited at a range right and the red curve would be excited at b prime instead of b and b prime what if re if you really excite exactly at the same well very close energies much close energies ra rather than you're doing it right now would your relaxation be still kind of showing very different behavior or not so i guess you can really play with initial conditions and see because right now your con conclusion kind of becoming a little bit uh, that spinner 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 kind of provides you additional channels and that's why it's faster it, it sounds very reasonable however again not necessarily that this is only reason right because you might be as i said like just because you excite to the low energies uh, not necessarily that these energies will be coupled to the same vibrational modes as in the case of A. So it's really your initial conditions might be also leading to this different behavior. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So yes, I'm not sure where, if you look at the density of states like deeper in the veil of fancy or leading to kind of confusion. More. Well, I would say if you look on a higher, sense. if you look on a higher energy, uh, the plots become not so much different anymore, right? They are really significantly different uh, in the near, uh, in the lowest transitions, in the lowest mm -hmm. uh, valence and conduction band states. But if you go, like you know, really several electron volts deeper in valence band and conduction band, looks like your red is dominating in both cases, green dominating in the holes and red dominating in electrons. So they become probably more comparable to each other. Okay, so yeah, just, just a comment. Yeah, I'm sure reviewers will bring that up too. I don't know if they actually computed that many orbitals, but that many couplings. And given that energy range, but I'm not sure that they will that. So since we're sidetracked with questions, <laughs> can I ask another one? Go for it. Um, so you, uh, figure six, panel A, you said that uh, due to the sparse nature of the orbitals around the, uh, the frontier orbitals, that's why it drops off. So does the nature of the orbitals come into play? Because later on you said HOMO through HOMO minus five are nearly the same energy in the same nature, so why wouldn't that speed up relaxation if they're at the same energy and very similar in nature? It does. So that's what the spinner. That's oh, where that's the big alternate peaks come from. Okay, so that is if you look at B, where if you do spin restricted, they're not the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. Exactly. That's it. Yeah, we're ready okay. for we're ready for the doping. Are we sure? <laughs> oh boy. Okay. So this is the open shell kind of system. So we computed it with two different basis sets. So for well, I guess even before that, we were dealing with transition metals. They have a unique chemistry and it depends on the environment around them. So in this case, we have a magazine that's dopamine inside a halide ligand field. So I guess if you take an organic metallic glass, they would call that like a weak halide field. So that's going to produce low energy splitting of your DNA shells, so you have a high spin configuration. So, so basically you have to checked a bunch of spin configurations for your geometry optimization, and we found that the high spin, or five, five unpaired electrons, gave the lowest energy. So that's what we did our ground state observables with. And we did it with a spin polarized basis and a spinner basis. So if we prepare both of them, we see that in the valence band, and both the spin polarized and the spinner have generally the same features. They both have these two little humps on the edges of them. If you compare the PDOS for both of these images, we see that they are due to 
uh, manganese hybridizing with bronskite to form those. And so if you look deeper into like the pedos, the bronskite atoms that hybridize with are the bromine atoms surrounding it, which makes sense. So it's a DEP hybridization that's occurring for the valence band space. Makes it sense. And if you compare the conduction band space with these things, you see that they are not exactly the same. So if you compare the orange lines between them, you see that the like the relative energies of them are about the same. It's like the edge of the valence band is like minus two and a half. And in the conduction band it's around zero. If you compare the spinner case, they're pretty much localized in the same spot. But we do see that spin orbit coupling reduces the band gap of the proskite atoms by the blood 16. So yeah, so the valence or the conduction band is isn't aren't doping atoms, which isn't which contradicts what's seen in experiments because they see manganese PL. And that indicates that we should have doping states inside this gap here. But this formula should be shifted more to the left for lower energy. And and the, oh, before may I, may I interrupt. So these calculations were done with GGA functional. Yes, PV. PV, yeah. And so I think again that we I kind of give you this already comment uh, for Sanibal Symposium. Uh, there was a paper from Katya Badaeva, two thousand eight or something. So when they were doing doping to left uh, to get zinc zinc oxide quantum dots, manganese and cobalt uh, two plus manganese two plus I guess as well. Uh, doping to the quantum dots, and uh, the first paper she she published was I guess in two thousand maybe seven, uh, maybe eight. So they show in the effect of functionals, and exactly same problem. So if you use GGA functional, then the manganese uh, manganese uh, uh, D level is too much. How uh, say inside the too close to the H, so it's not really contributing uh, to the gap of the quantum dots. But if you use hybrid functional like PD1, then this peak is shifting, and then it more or less kind of uh, corresponds with experimental data. So, so you can hard refock exchange uh, yes. pu pushes differently the valence and conduction band uh, f far away from each other and keeps uh, doping, doping inside the at least at least kind of affected. That's why the it's becoming band. becoming different. And I think if you recalculate this with HSE or PD0 functional, hopefully you will see this peak is moving to the right position. So yeah, I've seen, I don't think I saw that paper, but it was someone else who was doing transition miles, and they found PV0 or PV1, whatever it's called, uh, usually gives the right alignment. And I did try to do a calculation, but it includes, so it's a thousand atom system, or 2,800 electrons, and it spin over coupling with the hybrid functional. So I did 30 nodes for 48 hours, and it completed three electronic steps. So, yeah, I don't know. So I tried to do it, maybe. Oh, but, uh, Aaron, can I suggest yeah. something right, right now? So, um, if you practice the same thing and just do uh, an Elm number of electronic steps equals three, so that uh, after three steps it saves wave car, and then you re restart over, and if you pick up from where, where it stopped, so there is a chance to approach convergence manually. <laughs> because uh, th yeah. this, this question will be asked uh, again and again uh, by... Uh, did, you use, did you use PB0 or HSE? Uh, both. And both, both, both. both not... So, but again, they it's... But it's, the arrow is like, like, what exactly going on there? Why is it stopping? Because of all oh, the, just time all, and all time restriction. All time. Numerical yeah. resources. But so yeah. for this for this purpose for this purpose we have actually our um, uh, conda too where we don't have any restrictions in time. But it will take the whole conda. Well, if you need it, right? So it will it will block all, all other people. Well, from. but again, if it's needed, we we can wait for let's say if it let's say two weeks. How, how many nodes did you add on? You said forty. Thirty each is thirty-two cores, so that's oh, yeah. 
And it's a lot of processing power. Yeah. But I don't think that putting yeah. a lot of nodes really speed up your calculations if you don't have a lot of k points. Yeah. So you have really linear behavior yeah, with respect to k points. Comparisons have been getting quicker speeds with less nodes, but not necessarily for what you're doing. Right. So that's why I, I still think you, you have plenty. And also another thing just to, uh, I mean, I understand it's not a perfect, but if you just forget about spin orbit, then just uh, at least looks like you're probably able to do it with uh, without spin orbit couplings, right? Can you just calculate um, you calculate your system with HSC or PB functional without spin orbit? Um, it, or for Marvin, it doesn't make sense. Probably one, one can, but then uh, everything is... Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't make sense because spin orbit gives correction of. Uh, it does, but it looks like it's probably due to the liver rather than rather than Homa. So this this age is shifting, but Homa is not so much affected. Like this band looks not very different. This band is different. So that's why you can and and, and you you're talking about holes, right? So that's why you will see holes. Uh, everything is fine with holes. We need to adjust conduction band. No, no, this yellow one is not in conduction. It's in the balance. So in, in balance. Is it, so is it, that's why I said like it will appear somewhere here, and, and, and this band will be not in the right position. Well, it is uh, in, uh, interesting, but it will not resolve everything. Well, at least at least you can do a few steps to, to see that you see this change. Maybe to just in your uh, system. not as a main result, but to disarm the reviewer. So that uh, well, no, no, no. It will uh, it will probably <laughs> make the review even more I'll say excited in the sense that oh, why you don't then do it for for the case of uh, you know spin orbit spin orbit and your dynamics looks like it's important, right? <laughs> and we did try VFTU. Our our collaborator did, but that just made it worse. Mm -hmm. We pushed the. It, yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't help. It, it's also known again for for the systems like quantum dot with uh, doping. This this approach doesn't work as, as well. I'm gonna stop talking about that because it makes me sad. <laughs> so then, uh, here is a plot of absorption spectra for spin polarized, which are the green and orange lines, and spinner, which is the red. And the biggest thing to take away from here is we are able to see low energy so-called spin forbidden optical transitions. If you zoom in on this, so this panel is zoomed in 10 times, I think, or 100 times. And the lowest peaks, those are DD transitions, because like we said before, they're cross at the production bandage. But once you get around the band gap where the D is, you do see it. MN3D or hybridized MN3D uh, 3D transitions. So we are able to see spin flip calculate or transitions from our calculations. And yeah, I like the policy about that. And so for non ready, not ready to relaxation in the open shell system. The uh, interesting thing to look at is to compare the spin alpha relaxation to the spinner relaxation, or specifically the, the whole relaxation between the two. Because if we, there's this transition a bit. So if you look at the density of states, it's the, the valence band edge for both of them are pretty much the same between spin alpha and spinner. So it's a good comparison between how spin orbit affects transitions because the energy difference between these two states are basically the same. So so changes in energy won't change. So there's no changes in energy between the states. So if we do see differences in non radial relaxation, it should be due to the way that the orbitals are constructed as opposed to like a density of states or energy offset issue. So when we do look at that, we compare the two blue lines here, we see that relaxation is pretty quick away from the band edges. And then once you start getting closer to the edges, for the spin alpha system, there is kind of a delay here, but it's pretty quick compared to the spinner. 
So it's been up with completes like its first relaxation at around or some peak of second and then it relaxes to the homo states uh, shortly thereafter while compared to the spinner it takes about a full peak of second to get to the first relaxation and then the second relaxation that occurs takes about about 10 picoseconds. So, so there's a difference between the two. And just to kind of visualize that more, that's why I put these population figures in. So if you compare uh, initial conditions that are relatively the same in energy, and just let the simulation go, you see that the relaxation, that the initial relaxation is basically the same between them, and you have quick relaxation. And here there's a little bit of a buildup, but then the homo state is occupied fairly quickly. Also, the spinner case, there's a buildup here of population at homo minus one. And so uh, it takes a long time for the homo state to build up. And to investigate that, we can go back to the little table I made here. So, table three. So, this shows the orbitals. Home, or homo to homo minus four, their energies and their magnetization projections, which uh, from those you can infer like spin configurations in these systems. And just to note that the highlighted ones are ones that are occupied by MN, the 3D orbitals of the magnetism. So homo minus four, three, and two are And uh, what so the thing I noticed here is if you look at the MZ, which is where most of the projections are aligned, that once you get to homo minus two, to homo minus one, there's a drastic change in the projection. So that's an indication of a spin flip. And if we compare that to the population figure, so homo minus two to homo minus one is It's fairly slow compared to the other relaxation pathways in the system. And I didn't put it in here, but you can actually, if you look at the, the computer red, red field tensor elements, it's actually quicker to go from homo minus two to homo than homo minus two to homo minus one. And I guess, how do I say that? Is, I can't use spin transitions to rationalize that to a musical positive. So forget I said that. <laughs> but then, yeah, the only way I can explain the difference between a homo minus one, the homo transition being drastically different is due to spin orbit coupling giving better orbitals because strictly the, the, the orbitals should be very orthogonal to each other when there's very little overlap. So there should be very slow transition rates between them. So it could just be that the spinner orbitals are a better basis compared to spin polarized for describing the system. So we get slower realization. So to summarize that whole bit, the for the open shell doped process on that, there were issues getting or band alignments which correspond to the experiment. So we can't necessarily compare conduction band relaxation, but we can be fairly confident in our valence band relaxation data. And that shows that with the inclusion of spin orbit coupling, it slows down to relax full relaxation from the cross guide to the open compared to uh, essentially a spin restricted spin alpha transition. I attribute that to the spinner basis being a better basis just to construct the manganese orbitals than spin alpha. And yeah, that's basically what I put in my conclusions. Or the two conclusions that I verbally said for both the systems. So yeah, that is my presentation. Okay, let's thank Aaron.
Any questions uh, to Aaron from Fargo? Any questions to Aaron from London? Could you show me how to do that stuff or send me any little scripts or something? <laughs> I can send you a line. That'd be great. Good, good deal. London, from now on, your favorite equation is equation for non adiabatic coupling. Is that the absorption one anymore? No, no. You are already confident in this. And they're not so much different. Okay, more more questions to Aaron from Los Alamos? Okay, if no, let's uh, thank Aaron once again. So, uh, we will not see each other, uh, well, some of us, we will not have meetings next week. Um, because of the conference that runs from Monday to Thursday. Technically, when, if, if there are urgent things, there is a slot on Friday, but probably every, uh, those who present on conference will be traveling and tired. So let's uh, meet next time in a week and a half on Tuesday, uh, according to the schedule. Since posters are all, most likely are already printed by, by everyone, uh, little changes can be added by handwriting or glue sticking, right? Any questions we need, we need to just uh, discuss while we are on the connection? Is Javed there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what about your poster? Sure. Have you changed it or you use the same as you were showing on Tuesday? No, I have changed it. You want to show it now? Well, I would also appreciate if you yeah. if you if you send me email with your updated poster. But if you yeah, if you can show now, let's let's at least take a look on it very quickly. Like maybe ten minutes. Yeah. 